Are you guys ready to get into the Word of God today? I feel like today we just need to start off uh, just with just a little bit of prayer. Can we do that? So let's all bow our, ha- our heads, close our eyes, and let's just invite the Holy Spirit here. Father, we just thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, I pray that, that your word will not return void. We know that it, it never does, but Lord, I pray that it falls on fertile ground today. Lord, that your word is alive and active and is sharper than a two-edged sword that pierces the bone and the sinew. And so, Lord, I pray that today your word would pierce us in a way that has never pierced us before, that we would learn something about your nature, that we would see an aspect of your glory that we've never seen before. And so, Lord, today open our hearts, open our minds to what you have in store for us. And we just thank you for that in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Acts chapter 17. Uh, We are moving through the book of Acts. If this is your first time here, uh, I just want to kind of let you know where we've been. We've been on this journey since the week after Easter. So it's been a long time since we've been talking about and talking through and teaching about what happened in the early church. And we've seen how God moved early in the church and how his spirit just moved in a powerful way. And, and, and the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit descended on a upper room and how people were filled with the spirit and tongues of fire. And man, there was just the, the word of God spread like wildfire, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we see how this whole message throughout the, book, the entire book of Acts is how the word then continues to move from just a small little circle in Jerusalem to a little bit bigger circle in Judea to a little bit bigger circle to the uh, to Samaria and then now we're getting to where we're on the outer edge and it's we we are here as a result of this happening the church the early church that was founded Uh, by the Holy Spirit, is now here today. And this is over 2,000 years, and and we, we have seen and talked about how people like Stephen were murdered and how people like Peter and Paul and a lot of other people were persecuted and tortured and imprisoned because of this gospel. And this is what gives the gospel weight, is that if if the resurrection, because everything hinges on the resurrection... Everything that we believe in hinges on that one thing. You see, if Jesus was not who he says he is, then he would not have risen on the third day. And then if he had not risen on the third day, we would not be here today. We would be sleeping in at home. I mean, that's the reality of it, is that we are here because of a risen king who is seated at the right hand of the Father, as we were just singing, the Lamb of God who was slain and now is seated on the throne. That is who we worship today. That is why we are here today. That is why we lift praises to him. That is why we talk about him. That is why we read scripture. That is why we, we, we're doing everything that we do here is because of the Lamb of God who is slain and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. That is why we are here today. And this is why the early church survived, and not only survived, it thrived. You see, if it would all have been based on a lie, it would not have made it. At some point, people would have said, you know what, actually, it didn't happen. Actually, we have all been just perpetuating this lie And so, please don't kill me. I mean, that's the reality of it. If if it would not have happened, then at some point, everyone has a breaking point, right? Through persecution, through imprisonment, through beheading, through all the things that all of the disciples had to endure, they had to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that who they believed in was actually the Messiah, the Son of God. Otherwise, they would have given it up. 
And this is why we're here today, worshiping him. And so Paul is one of the main, I would say, the main focal people in the book of Acts. Peter at the beginning, now Paul. And we're talking about his missionary journeys. And we have talked through his imprisonment last week and how they worshiped the Lord through their bondage. And it was how, how they were free through their worship. And it's such an awesome and powerful thing when they trusted the Lord, no matter the circumstances, no matter what they were facing, no matter the imprisonment, no matter the chains, no matter what was going on in their life, they chose to worship the Lord and through worship people were saved. And this is why we worship him today because worship has meaning and it carries weight that the people maybe that are around us in our life would see how we worship the Lord even through our own circumstances. They're like, why, would you do, why, why are you worshiping right now when all hell is breaking loose in your life? And you can answer them confidently. It's because the Lamb of God has overcome. The Lamb of God has overcome. Jesus conquered sin and death, and I worship him. And so no matter what I face, he's still worthy of that worship. Amen? So we see Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they leave this place called Philippi, uh, and we see this in the last chapter. And you can also read what happened in the Philippian church through his letter, through Paul's letter to the Philippians. The book of Philippians was written as a letter when we know that we saw Lydia and we saw a jailer come to know Jesus and they were part of the beginning semblance of the church at Philippi. And now he has moved on. Paul, Silas, Timothy, they've moved on from Philippi. And through this miracle of being released from prison was pretty, a pretty incredible thing. This earthquake happened and the, the doors were flung open. Their chains fell off. Man, this is only because of an act of God. And so now he's moving on to the next town. And we know as, as we've read through Scripture, and I hope that you guys are following along reading what, uh, what is taking place through this book as, we are, as I'm preaching it to you, but you're also spending some time learning about what, uh, what is happening and doing your own research, and I'll get to that here in just a second. But one of the things that Paul does, and there's a pattern that he does, is that first he goes to the synagogue of the town that he's visiting. He goes there first. And there's reason for that because he believed that, that the gospel was for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. So he goes to the synagogue first to preach the good news. He's also listening for some things probably, but he begins to teach them in the synagogue about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so uh, as he does this, though, people then are like, hey, I, I want to know more about this Messiah. I want to know more about Jesus. And so as he's sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, people are coming to faith. And now the church in that area begins to be built. Well, now we are in, in a place called Philippi, or uh, we're in a place called Thessalonica. Can you say that? Thessalonica. Say that five times really fast. Go ahead. That's a little bit of a tongue twister. But we're going to see some things that happen in that place. And so it begins in verse 1 of chapter 17. It says, Then, And when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis, that's where the amphibians live, Amphipolis, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. And there was a Jewish synagogue, and as was his custom, there we have it, he went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. 
And see, to me, no matter what people thought about Jesus prior to the resurrection, no matter if they thought he was just a good dude or that he was a prophet or that he was a crazy man or whatever they thought about him, the the resurrection should have sealed it for everybody. To me, like that news right there and proof that over 500 people witnessed the resurrected king after the resurrection, before the ascension, that they witnessed him uh, being alive and well, showing people his scars, that should have sealed it. But that wasn't enough for the Jewish people of the time. They were looking for somebody else. They were looking for somebody that was going to liberate them from the oppression that they had from the Roman Empire. They were looking for someone that was going to be their king, their physical king. And they did not realize that this is all spiritual. That, the, that Jesus, the Messiah, was coming to rule and reign and, and be their king, but not in a physical sense, but he was coming to be their king in a spiritual sense. And he was saying, would you follow me spiritually? And many of the Jews, they still couldn't get past what was right in front of them. They couldn't get past their tradition. They couldn't get past uh, their, their upbringing. They couldn't get past their beliefs. They couldn't get past what, the pro- what they thought the prophets of old had said about this Messiah. They couldn't see Jesus. And so Paul, he's trying to reason with them in this passage of Scripture. He's trying to reason with them say, look, Jesus is all, th- it's all there, all through the Pentateuch, all through all of the Old Testament prophets, all those things, Jesus is right there. How can you not see it? And there were some people that said, oh yeah, I do see it. I do see this Jesus that you're talking about. I do see him through the scriptures. And now I do understand. And so it says in verse 4 that some of the Jews, they were persuaded by Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. They came to faith. They said, I am willing to trust what Paul is saying and how he was able to show us through Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. And because he is the Messiah, now I want to follow him. See, we have this vantage point ourselves of having this thing called the New Testament. And we can read the Gospels and we can read uh, all through the life of Jesus and we can all see it so plainly, but we didn't, uh, the people of that day didn't have that vantage point. All they had was the Old Testament. And so Paul had to demonstrate through the old scriptures, the old prophets here's Jesus. Here's Jesus over and over again. Hey, let me just help you see Jesus in this passage of Scripture that even Moses was a type of Jesus. We see through, even through Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah, we see through the prophets where Jesus is talked about. It's not his name, but it is his person. And so Paul was a very persuasive man. He persuaded the people and he spoke in an eloquent way and he met them right where they were and said, hey, I want to help you see Jesus. And sometimes, though, we find ourselves in the same place. Maybe some friends or some people in our life or maybe it's family that we've had conversation over conversation about who Jesus is, and maybe you're trying to help them understand that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why we worship Him. That's why I call myself a believer. And maybe you have had great conversations, but maybe there have been other people that you haven't had such great conversations with. Where they rejected the gospel, and like, you know what, I don't want to hear about this Jesus. Stop talking to me about Jesus. Anybody ever have that in your life? Know somebody that you've talked to and you're like, you know what, just, just quit. Just stop already. 
with this Jesus thing. See, I think we've all encountered people like that, that people that, that we have tried to share the good news of Jesus and what God has done in our life, and we share that with the people around us. And no matter how we say it, no matter how uh, we explain it, no matter how we open the Scriptures, people are still not open to the Gospel. And so today I want to talk about three different types of people as we encounter those different types of people and how we're, to, how we're to respond by them. We just read about one type, that how, how Paul persuaded those to, to see and to understand who Jesus is. They responded to reason. You know, it's interesting to me how uh, reason anymore is kind of in short supply. Have you noticed that? Especially in the climate that we live in, the political climate, nobody wants to have conversations, nobody wants to be reasonable, nobody wants to do anything. All we want to do is just argue. All we want to do is just, you know, nitpick. All we want to do is just be at each other's throat. All we want to do is, is, is fight, really, instead of being reasonable with one another. And so we have a group of people that, that are easily maybe even persuaded. Maybe you, based on a preacher or a friend or a relative, that you are open to the gospel and, and through a conversation with them, you are persuaded to follow Jesus. Let me just help you with this is that it's not the person's words that convinced you about Jesus. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit is the one that does the convincing. I can't convince you. I always say, you know, it's funny as a preacher, that I'm just the paper boy. I'm just, I'm just delivering the message. I can't convince you. I can't say things in such a way that they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe that now. Because Dan said it, then it must be true. No, it's all because of the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit begins to draw people to himself. And then you are just part of this process then. You may be the one that watered the seed or maybe you tilled the ground and we see Paul here, he was the one that actually was in a place to reap the harvest of the people that were persuaded and reasonable. And there was another category of people that responded a very different way. And he, he spoke to these people and they responded with rioting. And they said, I refuse to believe what you're saying. And we see this in verse 5. It says, but other Jews, they were jealous. And so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace and formed a mob. And they started a riot in the city. And they rushed Jason's house. I don't know who Jason is, but he sounds like a pretty cool dude. Jason, Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other believers before the city officials shouting, These men have caused trouble all over the world and have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. And they're defying Caesar's decree saying that there is another king, one who is called Jesus and when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials, they were thrown into turmoil. And they made Jason and the others post the bond, and they, then they let them go. I love what it says in the New King James Version of this. that, that says that they, uh, these who have turned the world upside down have come here. Man, I don't know about you, but I would love to be known for that. 
I would, be, I would love for this church to be known as a church that we pursue God with everything that we have. We pursue God with all of our might. We pursue God with everything. And as a result of that, the whole world has turned upside down. Man, that's a great compliment to a church. And see, these people, they thought that they were, that they were like digging at them, right? Like, man, they just caused all kinds of chaos and they're like, yeah, that was us. And I'm proud of it. That the, the fruit of our labor is stirring up the whole world. The known world at the time that the gospel was moving in such a way that it was causing all kinds of ruckus. And this ruckus was not a bad thing. It wasn't like, you know, chop over in, in Seattle. It wasn't that kind of riot. It wasn't that kind of turning things upside down. This was in a good way that people were coming to the saving knowledge of who Jesus is. And because of that, whole families and whole cities were coming to know Jesus Christ. Man, talk about change, right? We always want change. We want to see things change. Well, what better way to change is if a whole city turns to Jesus. What would it look like if Parker, a uh, park, a uh, park, park, I don't know where that came from. There's a Parker County in Texas. Maybe that's where it was. What if Parkland all came to know Jesus? What would Parkland, Washington look like if, if Jesus was king of this city? Now, what would, talk about turning this city upside down. Talk about doing something like just incredible. Talk about just a breath of fresh air. I mean, I drive down Pack Avenue every single day and I see the result of godlessness. You got to be careful of which coffee shop you go through, right? You might be surprised when the person opens the window. I'm not speaking from experience, so don't worry about that. I was warned when I got here. Hey, make sure you don't go to these drive throughs But you see the result of what has happened when people turn away from the Lord. And this is why the gospel is so critical for us. And it's critical for us to not just hold the gospel to ourselves, but to share the gospel with the people that are around us. Because you might see a place like Pac Ave and just think, man, we are in a hopeless place. Just look at the result the homeless that are there, the drug addiction, all of the, all of the things, the results of sin. And you might look at that and you're like, you know what? There's no hope. But the way I look at it is like, man, this is an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for all of us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So maybe, maybe a few of them, their world would be turned upside down because of Jesus Christ. But it's going to take all of us together being bold for the gospel, saying, you know what? I'm going to stand up for the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to cower. I'm not going to, to step, take a, a back seat. I'm actually going to be on the forefront of the gospel. I want to be out there sharing what God has done in my life. That's how the world is changed. The world is not changed by people just sitting back and waiting for somebody else to do it. As it says in Romans, man, who... Who will be saved if no one preaches? Who? And so I'm kind of like, you know what? If, if it's going to be somebody, it's got to be me. But what if we all had that same mindset? If not who, then me. So we see this riot begin to take place. And this riot isn't for what you think it would be. The riot happened in this passage as a result of something that's very different. See, we all kind of read into this and we say, well, the riot happened because they didn't like the gospel. They didn't like that people were preaching. They didn't like that the church was beginning to, to uh, be established. They didn't, they didn't do it because of those reasons. They did it because of a political reason. 
You see, they, they, they begin to share that, they were, that the, the people, their influence was, was beginning to be taken away from them because people were turning to Jesus. It was because of jealousy that they rioted. Jealousy blinded them from seeing what God was actually doing. That He was the one changing the world. In fact, there's a commentary by F.F. F. Bruce that said that, that it was that the jealousy that stemmed from the influence that Paul had among the people. People didn't care about the gospel. They just cared that Paul had more influence than they did. This is, where, this is what happens even within the church. That someone might have more influence than somebody else. And jealousy begins. And it may not be a riot, but maybe some turmoil begins. And I've seen this over and over within the church. Somebody has a little, has more friends than somebody else. Maybe somebody's voice is heard more than others. And the result is division. In the early church, there were people that saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. Division is nothing new within the church. So how do we get through that? We switch our focus from ourself to Jesus. See, every time there's conflict and division, we're always looking at ourself. What I want, the influence that I have, the message that I need to preach. Rather than saying, you know what, today we're here because of Jesus and Jesus alone. And I want to remind you even today that we are here for Jesus and nothing else. You're not here for me. You're not. You're not here for anything. You're here to worship the one true God who is Jesus Christ. I will name him by name every time. It's about Jesus. James 3.16 says, For where there's jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder. And every vile practice And so this chaos that was established in this area of Thessalonica, it's a classic example of spiritual disorder. Anytime there's chaos, that means that there's something that is out of order. And typically when things are out of order, it's because we want to place ourselves in a position that we don't belong. And so spiritual disorder happens when people become their own gods. They are driven by their own selfish ambition. They're worshiping their own accomplishments or maybe their own words. Maybe they are doing things that are taking away from the glory of God and trying to bring glory to themselves. That's spiritual disorder and that's when chaos within the church happens is that when we take our focus off of God and we place our focus either on ourselves or on a man. And I said this before a couple weeks ago. We saw a miracle take place as we read through, I think it was uh, chapter 15, 14 or 15. And people saw the miracle and they wanted to make Paul a god. And he had to remind people saying, look, we're nothing special. We're just men like you. But we serve a God that is all powerful. And so we're going to bring glory to him and not to ourselves. And see, this is where the church gets in trouble. And, and man, I have... And, and this summer... We've seen several, actually over the last few months, we've seen several pastors fall because of moral issues, because of sexual sin, because of unconfessed sin. And it's just devastating to the church. 
But the reason why it's even more devastating is because those pastors placed themselves in a position that brought glory to themselves rather than glory to God. And when they fell, people also fall away because the people placed them there. And I want to caution you in this, even here, even today, don't put me in that position either. Let's focus on Jesus. Let's focus on Him and Him alone. Even this week, I heard of a pastor that was very close to me, was fired for that very reason. And it's just such a gut punch. But it's not having people in their life that hold them accountable and ask them hard questions. And let me just tell you that you have some elders that do that for me. That ask hard questions. That hold my arms up. And you need people in your life that are willing to do that. Because pride is so easy, it, it's so easy for pride to set in saying, I can handle things and I can do things. And we've seen this over and over again through pastors that fail because they thought they could do it on their own. But it was because the people put them there and they believed the lie that they were invincible. Sorry, that's not in my notes, but I think it's something that's worth saying. So we had the reasonable, we had the rioters, and then we have this third category of people, and they are the researchers. And they were called the Bereans. And the Bereans responded by putting everything that Paul said to the test. And what they did was they held up Scripture and they heard what Paul was saying, and they said, let's compare notes. Let's see what Paul is saying, and let's see what the Scripture says, and let's see if this lines up. And we see this, this is such a great practice, and I will tell you this, man, don't take my word for things. A lot of times, you know, you, you, you come to church, and you're like, man, the pastor said this, and it's just gospel. And I would encourage you to study on your own, to go to the Scripture and like, you know what, Pastor Dan said this. I, I'm not sure what that means, but I'm going to go to Scripture and see what it says about that. See if this aligns. I want you to do this. I want to encourage you to study on your own. That's actually one of the demonstrations of spiritual maturity that you don't just take my word for it. You take the Word of God for it. Will you do that for me? So verse 10 says, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue, as was the tradition. And now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness. And they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And as a result of that, many of them believed, as did the number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica had heard uh, that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. And the believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join as soon as possible. You see, the Bereans, this is our example that we should live by, is that when we hear something, maybe we, we like a YouTube preacher, or maybe we see a little clip of somebody, or maybe we like you know just the little short videos or something like, I don't understand what that is. Well, I would encourage you then to go to Scripture and see how that holds up. 
Just like when someone prophesies over you and says that I have a word from God, you're, what you're going to do, the very first thing, is you're going to go to the word of God and see if it lines up. And if it does not line up with the Word of God, you are going to reject that Word. You're going to reject what is being said. And you're going to shake the dust off of your pants and you're going to keep moving. This is is maturity, friends. This is maturity. This is what I encourage all of you to do. This is why being in a Bible study is important. This is why being in a small group is important. This is why when we start in the spring, when we do our equip classes, that's why those are important things to be in a community of believers where you can actually put things to the test and not just say, well, that's, that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of Christianese. That sounds super spiritual. Man, that must be good. He used these and thous. So it must be from God. And thus saith the Lord. You laugh. But man, there are people that have bought that hook, line, and sinker. And it's caused all kinds of pain. So our example is the Bereans. What they did is that they received the message and then they examined the scriptures based on what they heard. And because of that, they received and believed. Man, that is, that is, that's great for all of us to do, is that we can eagerly receive the gospel. I hope that you're eagerly receiving what I'm telling you. But then on your own time, now you can go and examine what I have said. And then and my prayer and my hope is always that what I say lines up with Scripture. That is how I'm on my knees for that. But I'll mess up every once in a while. And it's, a, you know, I'm only human. But then as a result of what you found, you believe. And this is critical for us. See, the Bereans, they didn't have Bibles, but they had Jesus. People didn't have this collection of letters back then. They had to go to a synagogue. They had to probably had to check out a scroll like the library, I don't know. And then they had to search the scriptures because they didn't have chapters and verses back then. So they had to become students of the word of God. And as they were students of the word of God, they knew not only in their mind, but they knew in their heart what was being said lined up with what the old prophets said. This is why there's something that we call apologetics. Anybody ever heard that term? Apologetics is how you defend your faith. It's knowing enough of Scripture to say, I believe God and I believe in Jesus because of what God's Word says. Well, what does God's word say? And it's, it's a defense. It is preparing a defense. When someone questions you about your faith, you are able to give a defense of what you believe in. This is what apologetics is all about. And the Bereans, they knew the scripture and they examined the scripture. So that way, when they heard the gospel, when they heard what Paul is saying, they could now not just say, yes, that's what the word of God said, but they could also defend it. And see, what's happening in the world today is that we believe in this kind of, you know, I would call him like the Bee Gees Jesus, you know, he's like got long flowing hair and, and we're all into this emotional stuff. But what does the Bible say about him? And how can I prove through scripture that he is who he says he is? See, this is where it's, critical as we mature in our faith to not just have an experiential 
thing with God, but also to have a knowledge of who he is. A knowledge of who he is doesn't just kind of show up because you went to a worship service. A knowledge of who he is is spending time in his word, getting to know his nature and what he says, and this is what we believe in. And this is a critical thing for all of us. And this is my challenge to you. This is why I've challenged you. to, And this is why we're going through chapter by chapter this book of the Bible so that you will be equipped and you will know that you're not just taking my word for it, but you're actually in the word with me reading this chapter by chapter so that way you know what is going on. Because this is what it says in 2 Timothy It says there's a time that is coming when people aren't going to endure sound teaching. And they're but having itching ears, meaning that they are going to listen to whatever makes them feel good. And they are going to respond to the emotional aspect of Christianity rather than the knowledge of who Jesus is. And they're going to accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they're going to turn away from listening to the truth. And they're going to wander off into who knows what. And we see this played out right here, right now in Parkland, Washington. Is that there have been people that have bought into a lie? They've chased after myths. They've listened to things that just tickle their ears. And let me just tell you, I'm not here to do that. God didn't bring me to this place so that you could just always have a hype session. That you could always, man, I just feel great about today. I'm here to feed you spiritually. But my hope is that through a little bit of my feeding to you, now you're going to go home and be a mature believer and feed yourself too. It's not just about me spooning it to you. Just like babies. Babies, yeah, you get to feed them some applesauce, but as they grow up, they start to eat themselves. Not eat themselves, but eat food themselves. So that way when you hear teaching that's not sound, you're like, oh, 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 oh. You see, the Bereans, they were of noble character. They did their research. They did everything right. But the Bereans, we don't read the book of Berea. But we do read the book of Thessalonians. And actually, they get two. And so as noble as they were of searching the scripture, and they had an academic knowledge of who Jesus is because of Paul, it was the Thessalonians that actually got the letter and they were commended for their faith. And so I think there's a healthy balance that we need between the Bereans and the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians, they they received the word and they believed because they were persuaded. So there's an aspect of that that I think sometimes we need a little bit of, of, of convincing or persuading like Paul did. But then we also need to be like the Bereans where we need to put everything to the test too. And I think there's a healthy balance between those two things for all of us as believers that we would truly pursue after Christ Sure, there's going to be some emotion and there's going to be some great highs, but there's also some deep knowledge that we need too as believers. And the only way we're going to get those things is through our own research and through our own studying, not just on a 30-minute message on a Sunday morning. Because this is what it says in 1 Thessalonians. This is Paul's commendation to this church. It says, we give thanks to God always for you. Constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father that your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. 
with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, but with joy of the Holy Spirit, so you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Acacia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we not need to say anything. See, I think for some, you fall into the academic category. And for some, you fall into the emotional category. And it's interesting how the ones that were persuaded were the ones that were commended. It wasn't for the ones that were just the ones that were studying. And I've encountered a lot of people in this category right here. Well, actually, what you said was... I want us to be right here. Where... We want a knowledge of the Word of God, but we also want to say it with persuasion and conviction to where some of you, maybe even in this room, might come to the saving knowledge of who Jesus is. That is my prayer. That is my approach. That is who we are as a church is that we want to have a healthy balance of this, of feeding ourselves, but also chasing after God with all of our hearts so the people around us will see how we are living out the gospel and they might also be persuaded to follow him. Will you stand with me today?